Welcome to this channel, this is Wesley and it is Wesley's News. Today we're going to be talking about sending energy over a single piece of wire. That was done by Nikola Tesla, Summerfield and Gobau. And now we have a gland, the rear guard at real time. Not only the Gobau line is interesting by itself, but the longitudinal E field that is mentioned by Glenn who says neither one of them mine is special if it's proven that we're dealing with longitudinal E field we have a longitudinal properties over the system that utilize transversal electromagnetic wave and that gives us a lot of room to do any kind of experiments in connection to energy that we don't have to pay for. It is just one of the means of energy transfer from one form to the other that I have seen in Lithuania experiment and in Tariel Kapanaza house in Tbilisi, Georgia. No power, no battery, no any source of supply of energy and it worked. This one is different but this is for me something extremely special. Let's go to the video and see what we have. We have a few guys who are going to help me out. Top notches. Glenn Moore with his device allowing transmission of energy using single wire. This is not Summerfield Gobo line. However, it is similar as it is similar to Nikola Tesla transmission of energy using single wire. Last names, credentials and the position of the people participating in discussion would be skipped. One exemption, Dr. Roy, I called this way for many years, just automatic. The most important for me is the value of the contents in regards to the device.
And so uh, ran a set of experiments in which he measured the insertion loss of uh, something like 100 or 300 feet of this line. And uh, when he comes to calculating the insertion loss, he came up with a very low number as he swept from something like 100 megahertz up to 1,000 megahertz. But there's a catch. In his calculation and measurement of what he thought was the insertion loss of his single wire transmission line, he, he believes he has a transverse magnetic, not a TEM. By the way, when you feed a signal into a coax cable, it is a TEM signal. When you feed signal into twin lead, it is a TEM signal. When you feed a signal that you transmit into free space, it is a TEM signal. When you see and you feed a signal down a single wire transmission line, I think he calls it a transverse magnetic. In other words, there's an E field component along the wire as far as explaining the transmission itself. But what I was getting at is that he ran this experiment and as he swept it from roughly 100 megs to 1,000 megs, he came up with a relatively low insertion loss. That makes it look very desirable, but there's a catch. He assigned, he, he didn't measure, he assigned roughly 2 dB of loss for the launching structure and roughly 2 dB of loss for the receiving structure. And I've got a problem with that. Because if he's built the launching, launching structure out of low resist, low loss materials, solid piece of copper sheeting, so to speak, so to speak, where in the world is the 2 dB insertion loss coming from? He doesn't explain it as a input standing wave ratio. He doesn't explain it as local radiation in the free space independent of the single wire transmission line. So where does the 2 dB of loss come from? If he uses the 2 dB of loss calculation on the input end and 2 dB of loss on the launching structure for the output end, and what he's left over with the total system loss comes out with very desirable numbers. But that 2 dB of loss for the uh, launching structure, that gives me problems. So uh, although he's running a very interesting set of experiments of insertion loss versus frequency of this transmitting structure of this transmission line structure, as I said, the 2 dB of loss of launching on each end, that's troublesome to me. It shouldn't be there. If, if, if I build my antenna tuner out of low loss materials, it has essentially no insertion loss. If I build my launching structure out of low loss materials, it should have no insertion loss. If I put 100 watts into this structure of his, and it has 2 dB of loss, if it's real loss, I could go over there with my thermometer and measure how hot it is. He didn't do that. What's the mechanism of loss if it's not getting hot? That's my, that's my first assessment on what I saw with those uh, YouTube videos uh, that he's presenting uh, with. It looks like he's an inventor of something new happening here. The TM wave having longitudinal E field. His line was not quite a G line. G line normally is a conductor with a certain thickness of dielectric material around the conductor. He wasn't using the extra dielectric material. I think he was speculating that the uh, 10 thousandth of an inch of rust on the outside was somehow uh, uh, giving him the insulated material. But uh, his particular single wire line about a new kind of radio transmission, which had E field in the direction of transmission. Whenever you transmit a wave in free space, a radio wave, all of the history we know of up till now, and all the mathematics we know of up till now, is that signal must be a TEM signal. In other words, the signal you transmit into free space has to have an E field component, an H field component, and both of those are exactly at right angles to the direction of propagation. And he set up uh, cone-like antennas in his QEX article, in which he believes he was transmitting a different kind of wave into free space, which had a E field component in the direction of transmission. And he ran a set of experiments that he thought confirmed that. And some people were very skeptical about that. Here's the surface wave transmission line demo layout. It's a 12 volt power supply. It's good for, oh, I don't know, I think it's set 13 volts at 30 amps maximum. It's powering a uh, Toshiba 80 watt brick which 
is driving through a short piece of coax. It's probably half a dB of loss, no more. Transmitter is driving one of the older big full-size launchers, like I showed in the QEX article. Just clamped to a tripod with number 28 wire SWTL. The wire itself is running across the patio, maybe 35 feet or something, to another tripod at the far end. There is a second launcher. This one a uh, foreshortened one. It's about half the length and made out of Depron aluminum foil, so it's really lightweight. Um, both each launcher has about the same performance, probably about a little under 2 dB of insertion loss. The output of this launcher is fed through a piece of really lossy cable. It's small diameter stuff you can see here. It's about a dB of loss. And going to a bird power meter with a 100 watt slug, a 100 to 250 megahertz slug in it. The output of the watt meter is going to a 150 watt uh, 50-ohm dummy load. There's good reason to believe that any radio wave you transmit into free space must be TEF. Any method of transmission that creates a E-field component or an H-field component in the direction of transmission, that that component will very rapidly die out a couple of feet away from your transmitting antenna. Inside of a waveguide, yes. You can have an E-field component or an H-field component in the direction of propagation. But that's because the signal is bouncing back and forth of the walls of a waveguide. In free space, you don't have that. Well, if I look at the standing wave ratio into the whole system, we're seeing about, yeah, very hard to read, maybe about 90 watts forward, and maybe four, three or four watts reflected. Something like that. He's uh, talking about pointing vector. The word pointing vector is E cross H, where E and H are at right angles to each other, and at right angles to the direction of transmission. That's the usual definition of pointing vector. He has his own individual definition of pointing vector, which is unconventional. So here is a 12 volt power supply powering a uh, 80 to 100 watt transmitter. I'll turn it on. We're showing not all that much drive. It should be a bit more than I'm seeing, but let's say it's uh, maybe 80 watts or something. And meter to a dummy load at 146.46. It sounds very interesting. I'm pretty much in agreement with you. I think that the two decibel loss is radiative loss, but you know, he didn't really tell you. He had two experiments. One was uh, 35 feet of a wire, and the other was 350 feet of wire, and he quoted two decibel loss for both of those. So the inference is that the uh, wire itself isn't producing a great deal of the loss. So whether it's radiative or resistive, I, I don't know, and he didn't mention. And I agree that the pointing vector is, is not the same as uh, a magnetic field or an electric field. It's uh, longitudinal. Well, probably about 40 watts in. I don't know, maybe a little less. Both the regulator the uh, rectifier and the regulator are just warm, not even warm to the touch with that airflow. How about the behavior of TM modes? That's in waveguides, I'm sure, but I don't know about uh, this line of, of the gentleman. Maybe an air surrounding acts as a slowing medium. And maybe as he goes further with his experiments, some of these extra travels down. 
mail to the TY. Dr. Roy, please. Yes, I just assumed it was part of his launcher array that you know, he, he tells people that this is the mechanism from shifting the coax from TEM mode to TM north north mode. Yeah, he's proposing some commercial aspect of high bandwidth uh, data transmission on power lines using this technology. It gets George sooner or later. If that were to occur, somebody's going to be a, in your home, at a party, at your house, standing next to your refrigerator, and coming up with something to hack your computer. I, I assume what really ends interest you is the longitudinal aspect of the uh, electric uh, field. Uh, I, I'm thinking that you you want clarification for the transverse uh, magnetic uh, mode explanation. That would be my guess. That would be good guess. Wes, do you believe he has an explanation? I believe he has. But for that, we need him to uh, state it.